Russ, um, do you know what the word almanac means? Mm, I do not. I, I know it has something to do with like harvesting and farmers and something like that. Uh, it, no, it's it's like a collection. It's like a a bringing everything together, a bunch of different things, right? You are, in my opinion, an almanac on a certain subject. I'm an almanac? You're an almanac of the worst movies in history that you can quote every single line of. Like that to me is your one of your superpowers. And I, it throws me that. off, but I just I just wanted to share that with you. Well, I mean, I would say if I have a gift, it is definitely movie quotes or taking any word and then being able to put it into a song that exists and start singing. <laughs> I mean, poorly, by the way, but sing it. Uh, I would agree with the poorly part. But today's guest, Dennis Shapiro, is the almanac on alternative investments. And now he wouldn't call himself that, but he has a book that he wrote called The Almanac Investment or Alternative Investment Almanac Expert Insights on Building Personal Wealth in Non Traditional Ways. <laughs> Good try. <laughs> I mean, it was a long title. Okay. I did the best I could. But he shared with us today some pretty amazing things that I think. As you're listening to this, you're going to talk, you're going to walk away with tons of tools that will help you in your journey. Yeah, I agree. I, I love that it was very actionable, right? I mean, I think the the podcast title is taking ownership of the deal flow. And the reason that I, I feel so strongly that that title sums up this podcast is because there's so many times we can get in our own way and say, oh, opportunities just don't find me the way that you two talk about I don't have the access to things that that you guys do, right? I, mean, I don't run in the same networking circles. This podcast tells you and shows you different ways that you can take ownership, that you can get a part of it, and you can feel equipped to know how to do it well, as at least as well as Joey and I can do it by interviewing in our own style. So I hope that you will enjoy this podcast as we sit down with Dennis Shapiro and we talk about the alternative investment almanac, if you will, Joe. Let's jump That's in right. right now. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome into the show, guys. You're in for a treat. We have uh, author and alternative investor Dennis Shapiro with us. Dennis, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, guys. Russ, Joey, it's a pleasure being here. Yeah, I'm looking for some of those expert insights on building personal wealth in non-traditional ways, man. That's that's the subtitle of your book. So let, let's jump into that. Tell me, how did you start on your journey to becoming an expert, right? Like, first, we have to start somewhere. Where did that start for you? So that started when I got my first paycheck. When I got my first paycheck, I, I was recruited by the government when I finished my MBA. Um, and I got my paycheck. I saw that they were not only my employer, they were also my business partner because the amount of taxes that they were taking out. So uh, I went home that day and I Googled, you know, how do I pay less taxes? And the first result was highly legal. I mean, the first page was semi-illegal. Uh, went back, actually corrected it to how to pay less taxes legally. And, you know, the first whole page was a bunch of real estate investments. And I did the stupidest thing you can do. I asked a family member, I said, hey, uh, you're into real estate. Do you have anything you want to sell me? I strongly recommend that is not expert advice at all. It's expert advice not to do that. And they looked at their whole portfolio. They're like, oh, all right, here's my biggest uh, 
headache. Here, take that one. <laughs> uh, low income, uh, you know, uh, high crime area, uh, needed a full renovation, uh, probably paid double what it was worth. Just a whole bunch of um, a, a whole bunch of like perfect storm for the perfect first investment. Well, and- hey, here's the thing about that. They actually did you a huge favor, right? I think back in the book, Robert Kiyosaki, I know we talked offline, like everybody, we've read the Purple Bible, right? And he, he talks about the first job where he's like working in inside the the little grocery store in a little uh, convenience store with him, right? Like just to teach him what he didn't want. And I think that that's what your your family member did for you. It's like, here, I'm going to make you pay high price for something that's crappy so that you can learn all the things <laughs> that you need to look for next time. Good on him. So, or her so nice that. of them. So nice. To be fair, I don't think that was their intention, but I <laughs> couldn't agree with you more because if that deal went better and it didn't go bad, it could have went way worse. Uh, but just thinking about it from a timeline that in 2012, I could literally have thrown money in the air and I probably would have got a better return from that deal. But just thinking about it, if that deal went better than it went for me, I probably would have had a catalog of these short I mean, of these, you know, single family rentals in a bad area. And I probably wouldn't be where I am today. The, the, because of how bad that deal was, I was like, I need more passive stuff. And that was actually, you know, the whole reason that was like the motivation to, to start looking and be like, well, I kind of, I still like real estate. I believe in the merits of real estate, but what can I do where I'm not the landlord of a section eight low income property? And that's when I got into notes. And then from notes, I went into ATM funds and then discovered syndications. And there was this, this whole chain of events that happened because that deal wasn't ideal, let's just say. And that kind of got me into the path of alternative investments. Everybody kind of comes to this realization when they're working as a, um, a slumlord, if you will, right? In some of these super high crime, low income areas where it's just tough, right? I mean, the people that are living in those are dealing with chaos. And so unfortunately, they're dealing with chaos, which creates chaos around them. Right. For better or for worse, that's what happens. And and so when you're you're in that position, you're like, I don't want to be a landlord. I don't want to be a slumlord. I don't want to be anybody that's having to to deal with these sort of issues. And then the next the next step always seems to be how do I become more passive? Right. So how do I start looking for these passive deals? But I want to I want to ask the question that many people ask me is. When I start moving into passive, how do I avoid getting taken advantage of all over again, right? So now you're at least dealing with a family member that, that, that you know, for better or worse, screws you over. But in, in, when you get into passive investing, right, you start dealing with other people managing the product, uh, the whole project and the, the end result of it. How do you avoid the next screw over, which may even be a double or triple bigger deal? So this, this is like a really good question. And the answer is just loaded because in truth, when you're starting out, you almost can't help getting screwed over. But the good thing is that if you do the, if you learn from your mistakes and you network, like I'm a firm believer, network, network, work, network. And as, if you network a good amount before you ever make that first investment, you could probably avoid 90% of that investment. And if you do make that first investment, like my first investment in single family rentals, not a good experience, but I learned from it. I moved on. My first apartment building syndication, not a great experience. I learned from it and my next 12 were way better. Uh, so it's it's almost like, like, yes, you might get screwed over, but that should not stop you from learning networking and going out there and and actually taking the taking advantage of all the positives that alternative investments can provide you. Well, and by the way, the whole reason we're talking is because of networking, right? Um, Chuck in our community, our inner circle said, hey, you and Dennis, you guys are doing a lot of the same things. You, you're very like-minded, you guys should meet. Who knew what was gonna happen from that point forward? But the point is, is I think, and, and you kind of mentioned the idea that you may be screwed over in the process of starting investing, but how, how do you mitigate the risk, I think is networking, right? Because if you just stop, you get really interested in the space and you say, oh, I do, I want passive income. And the very first thing that you see you invest in, chances are you're gonna end up like what you're talking about. But if you really are connecting with other people and you're not just jumping into the first thing, 
you're going to have a lot better chance of running into the right circles. And, and so I think that's value. I mean, we have a community and Dennis, you're, you're a part of it. Um, and we went through it actually before the show. And if you're not a part of a community like ours, join ours, right? Go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash community. Um, actually go to forward slash passport and you get a free course with it. So you join the community and get a free course, but you got to be surrounded with people who are in the space so that you can mitigate that risk and get to financial freedom as fast as possible. All right, Joey, quick talk. And let's let Dennis talk for a second, right? <laughs> you, you said the first syndication you did didn't go well. I want to know what did you learn from that? So the next 12 went well. Everything. Uh, so, you know, and it was funny and I just want to throw in one more point on Joey's thing. Um, when I was at an, I was doing an, I was doing a talk at an investor dinner and the, the concept was, uh, the topic was networking. And I looked around the room and there was about 40, 50 accredited investors there. And we talked about the high cost of private securities. You, a lot of times you go in and the minimum is usually 50,000, right? That's like the gold standard for minimums for alternative investments. So I said, if you're starting out today, right? And you walked into this room, right? You could either go out and make your one investment, or you could pick the brains of 40 people here who probably each have invested in two or three syndications. And just from one hour of networking, you probably have the opinions on 120 different deals. And now you will be way better off making the investment after that conversation. So I, I could only imagine a community where there's 5,000 plus members like you guys, like you could. I'm sure out of those 5,000 members, there's probably 10,000 syndications of experience. So just picking those brains, you know, it's sometimes it's so hard because human nature is like, wow, this is so good. It can't be true. And then you kind of realize, okay, you know, it actually is this good. And then you just want to jump into it. But if you could just take that pause and pick that brain of that collective of your network, whether or not it's your community, whether or not it's a real life uh, event or whatever it is, you know, you could cut down on 90 percent of the, the bad experiences. So I, I just wanted to say that. And then let me go back to Russ. I kind of lost train. Uh, uh, train. What was the follow up question? Yeah, well, You said that that you the first syndication you did was bad and the next 12 went great because you learned the lesson in the in the first one. Well, tell us about all those lessons that you learned. What is it that we can glean from you so that way we don't have to make the same mistakes? So the first lesson was I did it on my own. Uh, that first investment, I found the operator myself. I did the due diligence. I didn't know what I was doing and performing the due diligence. Uh, I made the investment. There was a couple of things that kind of went wrong. It was, there's, these are the few key tips I tell every single new person in the space is you want to watch out for a new geographic location from that operator with a new property manager. You never want them to date on your expense because that recipe is pretty bad. Uh, the third key thing that I, I got out of it was there was the wrong debt on the, prod on the product. And then the fourth thing was that the overwhelming amount of units were one bedrooms and one bedrooms are the most transitionary unit count. So it's very hard to maintain a high occupancy. So those four things more or less doomed that project. And they were there. They were right on the business plan. So it was nothing that the operator was shady. I actually think very highly of the operator. It was more of my lack of experience where on the next 12 deals, I was doing it uh, through an investment club. And that investment club was asking those questions with me. Uh, so we, there was three of us and we went through it and then we're like, Hey, did you see this? And then did you see that? And there were things that I didn't see. And there was, it was just a better due diligence process by using the collective sum of, of the people involved. So talk, talk about the, um, the debt component. Like, I, I mean, probably don't want to get into super detail, but why did you say the debt was wrong for that particular project? So it was a bridge debt. It was bridge debt. It had high interest rate. I think it was over six, seven percent interest rate. Um, and what happens? Is it had very little margin for error. So as the business plan started to to not go as well as the operator expected, they actually the bridge debt actually turned around and they uh, basically like commandeered the main operating accounts. So distribution stopped, everything stopped. Um, and yeah, it, I, I tend to only do that. Uh, I, I tend to only invest in deals that have fixed debt now uh, from the start. I, I feel like that was one of the main reasons why, because if I feel like if the 
if it wasn't bridge and it was fixed from day one, it probably would have um, done better during the tor- turmoil. And is that because you now can make a business plan around that? You can understand the the variables a lot easier? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And financing, I would even say it, it's almost like 30% of the pie. Uh, it, it's uh, When it comes after the importance of the operator in a deal, I, I put the debt in on the deal as the second most important. Like I don't even look, honestly, a lot of people say, oh, geographic areas, you want to invest in places that are growing. Yeah, but that's not a secret. Everybody's investing. So you, there's a certain competitive built-in pricing to that. To me, the two most important things is the operator and the debt. If those two are good, like they could put a deal in the middle of a desert and it'll probably still turn out perfectly fine. So if you break down an operator and what makes a good operator, what would be the top two or three things that you would put down on your list? First track record, you know, um, are, are they coming out of a, you know, a coaching program a year ago and now taking on three, 400 units. Uh, so that's the first thing I love in-house property management that that's, one of my favorite things to see. Uh, so that vertical integration uh, in a property. Um, and then I would say transparency, the reporting. Uh, I like I, I like seeing quarterly. If you're going to go quarterly reports, I love to see detail. I love to see how the NOI is actually tracking with the property. There are certain operators that do that and then there's certain operators that don't. Uh, so there, I, I think there is a clear um, difference between standards of operators these days. This podcast is amazing. Almost too amazing, Russ. There's too many ideas and I don't know where to get started creating passive income. Well, here's the thing, Joey. I think one of the things you need to consider in that statement is what is it costing you to not know? What is it costing you not to take action? I love the statement that says you don't have to be great to start. You just have to start to be great. If you're struggling on where to start, you have to know what type of investor you are. Know your investor DNA. And if you want to learn more about this, you can join us in our Passport Challenge at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash passport. Get started today. What what I love about this conversation so far, Russ, is this is exactly the kind of thing that we're covering in our Passive Income Mastermind, right? As investors, none of us have arrived and so to take the collective, as, as Dennis has already mentioned, and to learn from his experience now and to say, oh, these are the things I look for, that is shaping the comprehensive investor that we're building in our mastermind. So by the way, if you're not a part of that and you're a credit investor, go to wealth.wallstreet.com forward slash club 200. And this is what we do like every single month and then twice a year in person, we are doing these sort of conversations to make a a fully comprehensive investor and to get to 200% of your passive income over your monthly expenses as fast as possible. So anyway, just, it's just reminding me of that. So, so Dennis, from that, that first multifamily syndication, you've had 12 since then, what other things has it led you to outside of that. And I know you cover this in your book. Maybe maybe you want to just mention some of those. Yeah. So once we started investing, so uh, we had the situation where I was actually at a different invested dinner, again, the points of networking. And I met, I'll kind of give a little bit of or, origin of the investment club because it's not a typical investment. It's not like you're going to Google this. Uh, I was at an, I was at a investor dinner. Um, it was a winery that was that they were, they were, it was actually a winery syndication and it's a, it was an interesting wedding play, but me and this other individual were asking the operator a lot of questions. Maybe we were being even annoyingly, uh, we, we were probably asking the amount of questions that he probably found annoying. So he actually told us to, we never met this other individual to stay behind. Uh, so I stayed behind with the, the other individual. His name was Matt. And we exchanged information. We realized that a lot of our questions were piggybacking off each other. So if I didn't ask my question, he wouldn't have asked his and vice versa. So we started exchanging emails. And then six months later, that was the formation of our investment club because we're like, wow, it was really beneficial to really talk through a deal and not just be like, okay, the presentation looked nice. Let me write out my check. Uh, So once we got that, his background though 
wasn't commercial real estate. I was just starting to really get into commercial real estate, but he was a tech guy. So he, he did a lot of startup, uh, startup techs. He did, he sits on a couple of boards. So he brought a completely different perspective than I did. And we started talking and then we brought in a third person who's more of a crypto guy. So the three of us started really collectively uh, investing in a whole broad suite of uh, assets. So everything we did, pri- we started doing private lending together. We started doing, um, we started doing the ATM funds. We started doing all of these other ca- asset ca- classes. So by us joining forces, and I will say, like with with a caveat, when you do do this, there's multiple ways of doing it. You could invest alongside another person, but you could also create a collective LLC and then invest through that LLC. When you're doing that, you have to make sure everybody's actually actively involved or you risk creating a security. So we, all three of us were very, very actively involved. We all approved every single deal, but it allowed us where maybe on my own, I would have done another two, three syndications. But with that group, I not only did syndications, I also did ATM funds. I did a whole wide range of stuff. So I credit that investment club as probably the biggest uh, proponent to my where I'm at today. All right. So I'm, I'm going to ask another question then since you led us down that road. We were kind of talking about how do we vet syndicators, right? What are some of those things? Transparency, track record, so forth. How do you or how did you or how would you advise someone to vet a partner? Because that's ultimately what you guys did. You created a small investment club and you said that you have two partners in the deal that, yeah. that you didn't have personal history with. So how did you go about vetting them? And how would you advise someone now who's thinking about maybe doing that of things that maybe you thought about as, as you've gone along? Yeah. I'm asking for a friend here too, just, you know, checking out partnerships. Go ahead. Uh, so the first piece of advice is to date, consider it a marriage. Like an LLC is literally a marriage. Uh, and it, it, can be just as messy as a divorce if it goes wrong. Uh, so the key is I didn't leave that invested dinner and that by that night there was an investment club. There was a seed to an investment club and that seed grew as we started exchanging a lot of emails. And I'm talking about an excessive amount. And then we went on to do like a Slack channel and all of that stuff. So the first thing that I would say is you really want to date and you would treat it as you're dating a significant other. Does the person have the right temperament? Does the right person have the right, um, the right uh, work ethic? And so the coolest part about these type of partnerships is because they're completely voluntarily, right? It's, you, no one's getting paid. We're not getting a paycheck for this partnership. So if I say I'm going to do something, I, I do it. And it's, I expect the same thing. Like, so when we were looking at a deal and he said, Hey, I'll respond by Wednesday on my thoughts on the deal. It was critical for me to see that he responded by Wednesday because there's, you know, he had two kids. I have three kids. There's reasons not to respond, but if those reasons are there when you're dating, what is going to happen when you guys get married? Right. So, you know, Put and do a little, do a couple of those little projects because before you ever get into an LLC, look at a couple of deals together and say, Hey, what and talk those deals out and say, like, Hey, you know, what would it be like if we do invest into this deal together? And then the other big, big thing besides the dating part is have everything in writing. There's an operating agreement, pay a lawyer, and uh, you know, make sure you get an attorney involved. Uh, be very, very clear on whose roles are what. Like in my investment club, I really bring a lot of the commercial real estate deals to the table. And then I have a guy who brings the crypto guy. Uh, I mean, I have the crypto guy who brings the crypto. I don't understand a thing about crypto. Uh, but at the same time, we still have to all okay our deals. And we have a documented conversation that we're all approving this investment. Uh, so those are the things I would say. So the first thing is give it time and date. You do not need to rush into it. And then the second thing is make sure everything is in writing. Hmm. So we got basically a new dating app for investments. It's a different type of Tinder, Joey. It's Tinder with the E, right? Joey, what would your Tinder profile look like for this T- sort of... What? I'm sorry, Tinder with an E. What, what do you mean? Yeah, you know, to Tinder deals. like Oh, just, Tinder. Yeah. Like, like how you like your steak? No, like Tinder, like, I don't know, whatever. Uh, you totally threw me off with that. I'm sorry. Yeah, like, 
I don't know. It, it doesn't matter. What's your Tinder profile is what I was basically asking. You got me off on maybe I chose the wrong word there. I know Tinder is a different type of commerce. I mean, I, I, I'm going to have to Google here. my definition is to Tinder an offer to Tinder uh, to carry out work, supply of goods, buy land, shares or price. There you go, you. Google. Why didn't you help me a second ago? You made me look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm thinking my profile says, you know, I, I'm the best partner you ever had. Um, I, I let my business partner go on a 30 day sabbatical <laughs> and just take it from there. I mean, strong to quite strong is what it says. That's what it says. <laughs> uh, all right. So I, I do want to get into this separately because we we're talking offline about how do you put together deals? Now you've got an investment club, right? You have two other guys you're doing deals with, but it hasn't stopped there, right? Now you have other people coming to you saying, hey, how can I invest with you guys? Talk a little bit about that journey. Yeah, so we, we, we gave it some time. Our track record on Investment Club was actually extremely impressive. And then we had we started having people reach out to us and actually, hey, can we invest alongside you or with you? So from those conversations, I launched my company, SIH Capital Group. Uh, we do do traditional syndications, but we also do joint ventures on smaller deals. And a lot of the things that I learned about security l rules were directly from that investment club because we had these conversations with regular attorneys and then we had conversations with security attorneys and we were given very, very different information that, uh, dependent on the attorney we were talking to. So a lot of like, this is a big expert tip, I would say, is that if you, if you try to do a joint venture and you go to a regular attorney, most of the time they will okay it. They will do the paperwork and they will okay it because they do not know the intricacies of security law. If you go to a security law, law nine out of 10 times, the deals that the regular business attorney, okay, is going to say, no, that's illegal. That's a security. So I was lucky enough to have multiple conversations with securities attorneys. I was lucky enough to have conversations with business attorneys. And what, what I kind of came out with was uh, when we do syndications, we do it as a security. We usually do a 506C or a 506B. Uh, but then when we have smaller deals, I use a lot of what I learned and the keys of J being a JV. So some of those things with being a JV is J, uh, JVs give more transparency to the members involved uh, versus what a regular syndication is. And so with a syndication, usually you're just getting your monthly report or your quarterly report. You're getting your tax return at the end of the year. There's really not much for it. Uh, this isn't compared to a joint venture. Joint venture is much, much more active because by the definition, in order not to be a considered a security, everybody in there has to be extremely active uh, with, with their participation. Now, that's where we started getting into actually finding tools to make sure that that active participation is actually being documented. Uh, so one of those tools I recently was introduced to uh, by someone in my network was a tool called TriVest. And there's probably tools like it. I just, I'm not affiliated with TriVest in any shape or form, but we use TriVest for our joint ventures because it allows where we can link our bank account uh, so that every single member of that joint venture can actually go log in and see the transaction history of our operating account. It also has a voting feature where whenever we need to make a ma major decision, we could document that vote on file. Uh, so it's a different level because if, if anybody's ever invested in a syndication and is used to a regular investor portal, because we do have a different investor portal for our syndications, it's a much different experience than when you're invested in a joint venture. So in, in, besides the fact of the transparency of seeing the bank account, I know that that's probably not in every sort of syndication that you've ever been a part of. And the voting feature, like someone's hearing this as I want to be a passive investor and you're saying I have to be involved. Like to what extent do everybody have to be a part of decision making or like what does it look like in a joint venture from their their, their capacity what do they have to do that's a great question so i always i like to i like to put jv like in the middle ground if if syndications are 
purely passive after you wire the money? Because I, I never say that they're purely passive because it involves due diligence before sending the wire. But if if after the wire we're talking about and syndications are purely passive and then owning like a single family rental by yourself that you manage is purely active, then JV is kind of sort of in the middle. Uh, again, this is not security advice. You should probably talk to your own attorneys if you try to mirror something like this. But what from what we've learned and what we emulate is that with JV, you have to be actively involved. But within that JV, instead of a general partner and a limited partner, you have what's called members. And there's managing members and non-managing members. And even the non-managing members have to have a vote and be actively involved. You're not going to get a vote when you know, you're talking about investing in a syndication, right? Like if they're turning a, a unit, they're not going to send you a, a message saying, hey, do you, should we use the white backsplash or, you know, the pink one? Like that doesn't happen. But with a joint venture, we're literally giving our, our investors updates per unit, what's going on with these tenants as we're trying to relocate them, uh, how many at rental applications we sent out. We also offer our our investors in that deal, like if they have any rentals nearby, maybe we could use some of these tenants as relocation. So it's a much more interactive process. Now, how much, how involved they want to get is, will be dependent on their skill set. Like we have our construction manager is also an investor. So he already has a role on the project regardless. Uh, we have a, our commercial insurance broker was our investor. So he has a role in the project regardless. So a lot of times these people already have some kind of relationship with the business venture anyway. So it's not hard to say that they're active. But then other times, they're just people who read the emails and then get back to us and say, hey, maybe I can take on this little project or something like that. Or they're a digital marketer and they're like, hey, I can help you build a website for it. Uh, or I can help you create the, uh, the, uh, you know, the advertisement campaign. You know, so it, it opens the door to taking that next step from being completely passive but it doesn't mean you're the one that's going to be getting the calls from the tenants and everything like that. We still only have three man managing members and we are probably responsible for 90 to 95% of the daily activities there. I, I love that. I love the way that there's so many different opportunities to get involved. Like you shouldn't use the excuse that there's not an opportunity. Like I just don't have a place to do this. This is only available to this this person or these group of people. There's so many different ways that you can get involved to creating passive income so that you can become financially free. And Dennis, you're doing an amazing job of laying this out. And at the end of the day, there's also opportunities, as you said, you, you learn the operator, you learn that maybe I do want to be super passive. I'm going to get involved in a security. Once I've done all the research before the wire, then there's things that I can get involved in. You guys have created syndications in many different spaces. You want to speak a little bit to some of the things that you guys have done and some of the things that you're excited about doing and going forward? Yeah, so for the joint ventures, we usually stick with the smaller deals, but with the syndications, uh, we have two main different products. The first one is we have an income fund for credit investors. And one of my things is before I ever invested in my first single family rental 10 years before that I was an investor in stocks and bonds and the one thing I struggled for those 20 years was to find an income solution from from Wall Street products uh, you know and I tried the REITs the utilities the MLPs every single strategy came to the same conclusion that the extra yield is not covered by the liquidity that's involved in the asset and then once once a, once an asset is purely liquid, then it's purely volatile and then volatility destroys the yield. So when I was for 20 years trying all these different income strategies on Wall Street, I realized that when I have a chance and I started realizing my alternative portfolio was actually doing that role for me, what I was looking for from Wall Street the whole time, I wanted to create a fund that, that emulates what you would see in a REIT we're, we're diversified into 196 different properties. We pay a fixed 7%, but we pay it monthly from day one. Um, that's one product that we have. And then the second product that we have is individual syndications. And we are our primarily focus is affordable housing, which its own little niche. Right now, commercial real estate is a very, very tough industry where things go on to market and get 40, 50 bids. Affordable housing is one of the only 
is one of the only niches in commercial real estate that has a natural barrier of entry because you usually need county and state approval. And a lot of times these lie tech developers, low income tax housing credits, that's what they stand for, which is like the primary tool that the government gives for developers to build affordable housing. A lot of times they don't want to risk going to market with these deals because they could get a bidding war and the person who wins the bid doesn't get certified by the state. It, does, it doesn't do them any, any good. So from a syndication perspective, we focus on affordable housing and then we do some JVs and then we have the income fund. Uh, so we have a, 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 a broad selection of different investments. Man, so good. If someone wanted to reach out to you outside of just connecting inside our community, which is what Joey, you were alluding to earlier, everyone should be doing that. You should be a member of the community. You should be hitting every one of our guests up within a DM function so that you can pick their brains behind the scenes. It's kind of one of the benefits, right? It's it's one of the cool things to be inside the club. You can you can actually talk to these people that you're hearing on this podcast. Dennis, outside of that, how would someone want to connect I'll be able to connect with you. So the first thing I'll mention is is my book. You can find it on, on Amazon, The Alternative Investment Almanac, Expert Insights on Building Personal Wealth in Non-Traditional Ways. I always have to take like a deep breath when I say the full title. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the, the other place that you can find me is if you go on SIH, capitalgroup.com. You can get the bridged version of my book for free if you join my email list. Uh, We do a monthly webinar. And yeah, that's the best place. SIHcapitalgroup.com. Awesome. Awesome. Dennis, I'm so grateful for networking. I'm so grateful for uh, Chuck to connect us and for us to be able to share uh, a a like-minded strategy to get people to financial freedom and uh, you did not disappoint, my friend. Thank you for being a part of this. And for those of you who are listening and are on your own path, we are, are grateful to have you with us and we will see you on the next episode. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.